We think it's the one that came from the third pandemic, which hit San Francisco from China in 1894 through the trade ships. And it's worked its way throughout the sort of natural fauna and flora down to Galveston. The story um, of bubonic plague in Galveston started to expand. So the flea itself regurgitates or defecates, what a lovely description, <laughs> into the little puncture wound that it makes in your ankle. And that's how you become sick. Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. This episode comes from the Rosenberg Library Conversation Series, where I sat down with a few historians to talk about some extremely interesting historical facts about Galveston and Texas history. I would like to personally thank the Rosenberg Library for allowing Galveston Unscripted to hold live podcast conversations in the library. This conversation series was such a great experience, and I really look forward to picking it up again in the fall of 2023. And a very huge thank you to our guests. Check the link in the description for the direct links to the books that our guest has written. If this is your first time listening to Galveston Unscripted, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. If you've listened or watched before and you enjoy the content we are putting out in audio and video, please make sure to like, subscribe, and review the podcast. Leave us a review, leave us a rating. It really helps other people find what we are doing here at Galveston Unscripted. Your rating and review helps other people find Galveston Unscripted and discover the amazing history of our little island. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all those social media platforms. Without further ado, let's hop into this episode with Dr. Paula Summerlee. My name is J.R. Shaw. I started Galveston Unscripted, a podcast back in July of 2021, and it was always my dream to have a live audience and discussions in front of a live audience and um, just further education through in-person means and digital means. Um, so we're recording this entire conversation. It will be available on the Rosenberg Library's website in a few weeks, as well as my podcast feed and YouTube. So, all right, I want to dive right into this, Dr. Sumley, but before we do, I'm gonna introduce you a little bit. You have some pretty amazing accolades, uh, but I'm gonna read a little short bio here. Dr. Paula Summerlee was born in the north of England. Her academic background is in the history of medicine, paleopathology, a fine, and fine art photography. She has researched and curated medical exhibitions in Galveston, Cleveland, Chicago, Scotland, and London. Her interests include the history of anatomy, pathology, and forensics. Currently, Paula is a curator of the Old Red Medical Museum at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. The new museum will be housed in the former dissection lab, which we will be discussing today, on the top floor of Old Red, or the Ashbell Smith Building. It's a gorgeous building if you haven't been over there to see, it's amazing. The oldest surviving medical school building west of the Mississippi River. So pretty fascinating um, office you have over there. It's, it's quite nice. Did I miss anything? No, that's very, very kind of you. Could you tell us a little bit about where you're from and, and how you ended up here in Galveston? Um, this is a disclaimer, I have a secret project called Galveston is Purgatory. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> I, think uh, I was here in a former life and it's a kind of holding bay. Um, I ended up in Galveston, it's a really long story, but um, I was born in Wall's End, which is um, in the northeast of England. It's famous for shipbuilding and Sting, I guess, is a local lad. <laughs> and I was always interested in history. And um, I uh, did archaeology after I left high school and um, went to um, a dig and picked up an artifact, which happened to be a piece of um, bit from a Roman horses. And that just touching history. I always knew I wanted to deal with the past. And um, so yeah, I've, I started off in archaeology and I've always been interested in disease and human remains, the human story. And also I have a, a love of photography. So to cut a long story short and miss out multiple degrees, I kind of merged my interests when I did a, a doctorate at the University of Glasgow um, on the history of clinical photography. And then I fell into the world of medical museums and I had various research jobs in the United States, first at Case Western Reserve, and I kind of fell in love with America at that point. I loved Americans and the, I took off my 
stiff British social armor. And, became, and I just fell in love with the American people and had several positions in the United States. And I came to Galveston to do um, a visiting scholarship at the Institute for the Medical Humanities. And I curated an exhibition called Abstract Anatomy. And towards the end of that six month scholarship, um, the head of the Institute for Medical Humanities mentioned there was a museum task force. They knew I'd developed a medical exhibition in Scotland and would I be interested in meeting the task force and so on and so forth. So that was 10 years ago. And October the 8th is when I came to Galveston. So it's been a decade of developing a museum. Well, that's, that's awesome. That is great. Um, and I'm really glad you made it to America and Galveston because I, I think what you're doing and your research is definitely an asset to our community and our history. Um, so let's dive into this. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the founding of UTMB, why UTMB was founded here in Galveston, um, and then we'll get into diseases? Sure. Um, so the, the Galveston has several medical schools um, pr prior to UTMB. Um, notably the Galveston Medical College founded by Greensville Dow in the 1860s. And then the Texas Medical College, which was a precursor to UTMB. It was located almost on the same site as um, Ashbel Smith Building, um, Old Red on, on 914 Strand Street. Um, so the Early medical schools are something that really interests me. I have to say, wherever I go, local history is really important to me. When in Rome, you know, do yeah. what the Romans did. So um, I like to start metaphor metaphorically digging for stories. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Old Red is really, um, I call it an enigmatic building. I remember when I first saw it 10 years ago, I thought, what is that doing there? And to cut a long story short, it was voted on by the people. Ashbel Smith, was, a, who was a, on the Board of Regents at the time in the 1830s, 40s, was very pro having a, um, a medical school on the island because he actually had a house here. So it ended up here through various supporters. And I have to give a shout out to the John C. Lee um, School of Nursing, which was um, housed next door to um, Old Red, and that opened in 1890, a year before the School of Medicine. So Galveston, you know, when I think of Galveston and, and the founding of these medical facilities and universities, um, I guess it's, Galveston's the perfect place because we have a port and we have people coming here from all over the world. Um, and Galveston, before we get into the bubonic plague, there were plenty of diseases passing through Galveston and that devastated the island. Could you tell us a little bit about the past diseases that I guess the, uh, the universities were here to study and look at? Yeah, um, not just the climate, I guess, in terms of history of medicine, Galveston is synonymous with yellow fever, dengue fever, smallpox, but you don't really hear much about bubonic plague, which I think is rather interesting. And it wasn't really on my radar and, uh, until I stumbled upon something which we'll talk about later. Um, also, the positioning of the hospital and the medical school, if you think about the port, um, trainee doctors and nurses would be exposed to um, trauma cases, railway injuries and so on. So that was another reason. Um, you got a lot of um, hands-on experience by dealing with a whole range of illnesses and um, trauma cases. So growing up in, in Galveston, in the Galveston area, I'd never heard of the bubonic plague in this area at all. I always thought that was a 14th, 15th century problem in Europe. Um, how did you stumble into the bubonic plague? <laughs> um, so when I came to Galveston um, 10 years ago, it was actually for a one year position. Um, UTMB in its past had museums of anatomy, pathology and surgical pathology and when I was brought in, I was brought in to make an inventory of those collections. And then I thought I'd do that and then I'll be back on the other side of the pond before I know it, <laughs> before I know it. And what I realized, it was like painting a bridge. You get around the collection once and then you've got to go around for another reason and another reason and another reason. 
And it turns out those collections, anatomy, um, human um, the structure and shape and form, um, different joints, uh, pathology, diseased organs and tissues, um, which are acquired um, during autopsy or um, after surgery, and um, the surge pathologist um, removed during surgery. Those collections turned out were really important to the history of UTMB. Um, UTMB had a national reputation for excellence in practical medical education. And those collections and those museums during the 1890s, early 20th century, um, were at the forefront of attracting staff, faculty, and students to UTMB to study. Um, those collections have had a bit of a checkered history. Um, and during the 1940s and 50s, um, the museums closed. The specimens were either destroyed or put out of sight, and some are still out of sight but it follows a well-known pattern of what happened to other medical museums in the United States, for example, the Warren Museum at Harvard. So there are known patterns of museums closing due to shifts in the curriculum, introduction of imaging, the social and ethical reasons of the whole different. Uh, there's a lot of complicated reasons why, but UTMP falls into those patterns. And those collections are really important to me and a lot of people who know about their existence and we're hoping they will form the core vision of the new museum. So um, you're, you're dealing with these, I guess, these collections and you stumble upon something that kind of triggers you to say, hey, I need to like look into this a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so um, I mentioned the collections had a checkered history. Um, they obviously survived several storms and I'd like to do a podcast with some of those specimens if I could. <laughs> I wanted to interview, interview a brain <laughs> preserved dry <laughs> since 1897. I think it's have an amazing story. <laughs> we also have um, a little facial bone, um, which um, is a kind of mounted tiny little bone in um, a little glass box on a wooden base. And when I was doing an inventory, literally my job was what do we have? Put a label on it, give it a number, next, move along. And I found this little box and I couldn't quite see what was in it. So I tried to remove some of the dust as I thought and I, and I started to cough and splutter and I realized it was Ike silt. I'd heard all these stories of Hurricane Ike and the silt and how this was, this had gone through Hurricane Ike. It was all waterlogged and dried out. And I talked to one of the technicians and lo and behold, yes. Um, there was about six feet of water um, in Old Red in the basement and that's where they stored the cadavers and some dry specimens. So um, the technician brought up some of the specimens uh, to dry out and then I stumbled upon one. And I just thought this was a really important story that these tiny little fragile jaws have su survived so many natural disasters. It's an amazing story. So amongst the survey, uh, the pathology collection I wasn't here during Hurricane Ike, but it was housed in what I believe was called the old micro building. And that, that's been totaled now. But um, the building flooded and the pathology collection was in there. And I've heard stories of the tiny little jars floating off the shelves because the jars are this size, some other kind of this size. Um, <clears throat> so when I started, there were um, the collections had been salvaged um, by a company that didn't specialize in human remains, of course and the jawed specimens have been put in black plastic drums with sawdust, which was what we call tombolas in the UK, <laughs> when you stick your hand in and pull something out and you get a prize. <laughs> well, it was, very, it was very like that. <laughs> so I was getting to the end of the inventory and I was hoping to find something really interesting. And so a tombola, I pulled out a little jar, a specimen of bubonic plague. And I was so excited and I thought, I hope there's more than one. And th there wasn't, there was just this tiny little jar, not very aesthetically pleasing, unless you're a pathologist. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I want to know a little bit more about that. And little did I realize the incredible story that jar would un sort of reveal itself and how that the story from one jar led to several other stories. <laughs> 
So that leads us into you discovering the bubonic plague outbreak uh, in early or ni- early 1900 Galveston. Um, so c- before we hop into that, could you explain to us what the bubonic plague is? Yeah, so um, bubonic plague is um, it's a bacterial disease and um, it's acquired through um, actually cuts or abrasions in the skin. There's different forms of bubonic plague. Pneumonic is when you inhale the droplets. And essentially um, the disease is carried by rats and spread by fleas. So I'm sure most of you have been bitten by fleas one time or another, and you probably know it as they go around your ankles when they jump up on the floor. And um, so the flea itself um, regurgitates or defecates, what a lovely description, (laughs) into the little wound, the little puncture wound that it makes in your ankle. And that's how um, you become sick and the bacteria spreads into your lymph system. So you'll have huge swellings on your neck or your groin. And they're what what are called buboes. I actually thought, where does the word bubo come from? It's actually Greek for groin. Mm. I I didn't know that until today. We all learned something. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so these swellings are synonymous with bubonic plague. And black death comes from, so you have hemorrhage in these lymph nodes and they bleed and um, essentially you will develop gangrene. Mm -hmm. So if you Google black death, you'll see gangrenous extremities primarily at the beginning. And that's where kind of black death is probably synonymous. Or you're gonna have, I think the Danish 16th century um, description of black death actually meant that you're not gonna have a cheery outcome. Oh. (laughs) Okay, so you discover um, you discover in this jar and you, in uh, this body part that had the bubonic plague, um, and you discover the outbreak. So, can you tell us a little bit about the bubonic plague outbreak in Galveston in 1920? Okay, so the the little jar that I found, um, it had um, a number um, etched on the, on the lid, and that number um, corresponds to an autopsy protocol. Um, or report, which gives details of the the individual, their race, immigration status, sometimes occupation, all kinds of data, which is really interesting in terms of social history. Um, Also the clinical description of what happened to the person. Um, So using that information, I could leap from um, the jaw to an autopsy protocol, and I knew the Moody Medical Library, the Blocker Collections had a plague laboratory notebook. I didn't have the name of the individual at the time, but I soon found out who it was. I matched the dates of death and so on. And I thought, I know, I know who this person was. And then I researched where they lived on Google Maps. Is the building still standing? We found the grave marker. And at that juncture, I gave a little presentation um, and Dwayne Jones, the director of Galveston Historical Foundation attended. And, and given he's a visionary, he said, I want to know more about this, Paula. So we developed, we actually researched more about the outbreak of bubonic plague and the the people involved in the outbreak. And so that really is how the story um, of bubonic plague in Galveston started to expand. It's very much a sort of collaborative effort. I was so enamored with my little jaw. Would I've got beyond that to the rest of the story? I'm not wholly sure, but that tiny jaw answered so many amazing questions and Dr. David Walker, who is, um, uh, he was the former chair of pathology at UTMB. He's a world renowned researcher. He happened to have a set of microscope slides in his office, which he gave to um, my mentor, Dr. Judy Aronson. And it turned out we had all the slides of um, the bubonic plague victims that we could research. More about that later. Yeah. Well, let's let's get into the victims. So um, and and kind of the the outbreak itself. So could you tell us the about the the first discovery was first discovered in 1920 and kind of how it spread and and what was going on at the city in the city. Okay. So um, when the first um, person um, he went to the John Seely Hospital, they didn't actually know it was bubonic plague. It was um, there's various techniques to. Um, diagnose the, the, the disease, which are kind of complex, but essentially you stick um, a needle in a syringe into the, the bubo and extract some fluid 
and then you can look at for different cells under the microscope, but you also use some of that juice, as they call it, and inject it into a poor little guinea pig. And if the guinea pig develops swollen lymph glands, you can be pretty sure it's bubonic plague. So, so this was the, the first victim of the plague. Do they, do they know how he got it? Was it um, like a rat or flea from a ship or anything like that? He worked in a grain store on 29th and Strand Street. Mm -hmm. And so kind of forensic minded, they got, went to look to see if there were dead rats. And you can imagine rats are attracted to grain. So there's probably a lot of rats in the grain store. And so that's probably how he was infected. Um, and this young man, he died, I think it was during June, June 17th, 1920. And he died early evening. And the next day he was buried in Lakeview Cemetery uh, before the press got hold of what was bubonic plague on the island before they actually um, you know, spread the word as it were. Was there, were there bubonic plague outbreaks anywhere else um, in, the, in that year or years prior? Um, around around uh, the same time, um, Port Arthur, um, also Pensacola, Flor Florida, um, New Orleans. So this wasn't unique. Um, the actual origin of the plague in Galveston was never, um, never determined. Um, there was never one, one sort of true source found. They did map uh, all of the victims. There were about 18 people who um, um, were diagnosed with bubonic plague and their, their stories have different outcomes. The second person to actually um, be, to be diagnosed with bubonic plague was a colleague of the first person to die. Um, so obviously proximity there, but I guess she was working in a rat, you know, in a rat infested um, store, so no, no wonder. Um, so they did map where everybody lived. The streets that were involved went anything from um, like Avenue 11th to 33rd, um, different age groups from age three to 70, um, different ethnicities, occupation, anything from a pathologist to longshoreman. Um, and what's really interesting in the summer of 1920, if you go through the newspapers, it's, um, it's very Galveston-esque. Um, there was a longshoreman strike that had been long brewing um, along Harborside to do with trade unions and there was civil unrest and martial law, a bit of bubonic plague around the Strand area and then the bathing beauty parades on, on the seawall. And um, it's really fascinating to, uh, you know, Charlie Chaplin's movie he was on at the Tremont Theatre. It's like nothing really stopped. <laughs> That's my next question. Um, there wasn't mass pandemonium or, you know, once this hit the news, were, were people really worried about it or do you, do you know? Uh, I don't, I think the major changes were probably in terms of the community was asked to really get involved in trapping rats and the city did employ rat trappers and um, you were encouraged to trap and kill your rat and put a label on it and drop it off at um, a plague laboratory, which was set up just a few weeks after the first case had been diagnosed um, on 20th and a mechanic. And that little laboratory is en endlessly fascinating. And um, I'm always, I think as a child, my favorite word was why. I get one piece of information, and then the next one is already lined up, but why, where is it? Mm -hmm. what? So the little plague laboratory was um, on 20th mechanic and you take off, you drop off your little disease rat with a label because they were trying to find out the, the kind of focus of where the infection started. What would they do to the rats when they received them in this laboratory? Well, they were looking for signs um, of bubonic plague. Um, rats, which had essentially swollen glands, they also analyzed the fleas as well. I can't imagine that. In the summer of 1920 in a tiny little makeshift laboratory. Charming, no gloves, no nothing. <laughs> And between June and towards the end of 1920, I think the lab was active probably to August or September, they examined 46,000 rats. How many different doctors or assistants were working on all these rats? Was it just a few? Probably just a handful. Um, Dr. Mark Boyd, um, he was a professor at UTMB. He um, led the lab. 
and um, there's lots of wonderful photographs in local archives and the Galveston Texas History Center. You can see some of the activities of them examining rats. Um, they had the little makeshift post-mortem autopsy suite. <laughs> can you imagine that? Dropping off your diseased rat at UTMB nowadays? Yeah, I can't. and what's really interesting is the adverts, you know, um, the Boy Scout movement would um, post flyers um, telling people to, you know, don't have trash and garbage, as, you know, don't have harbourages that are going to attract um, vermin. And so it was a real um, kind of communal response, um, not just the experts, but um, the community really got involved as well. So the so when the city got involved, besides um, turning in your rats, what were some other prevention methods? I know there were, there was poison used. Um, what were some other prevention methods they used? Um, fumigation of buildings. There are images of um, I think they used cyanide, um, so they seal up buildings. Um, they also um, fumigated um, cargoes, you know, coming in and out. Um, of, the, of the port. This is really to ensure that there was no sort of official quarantine. They didn't want to damage the economy too much. Um, rat proofing, we we'll maybe go on to that. Um, various ordinances were brought in um, and um, corner stores were required to have um, several forms of uh, rat proofing, some of which still survives to the present day. Um, another thing that really fascinates me is, I don't think it happened in Galveston, but um, they also fumigated mail during mm. various epidemics and pandemics. So you'd open a letter and if, if, the, if the sender had smallpox. <laughs> and um, so fumigating mail is different. They would actually pierce the envelopes and so on and so forth. It's a, postal history is something that kind of fascinates me. Um, so yeah, fumigation, obviously um, putting out poison, um, also, the seawall had messages painted on it about that they actually put poison in the rocks um, along the seawall. And I happened to purchase um, a tiny photograph of two women in bathing suits perched on a rock, and you can see this poison behind the <laughs> doped on the seawall. Mm. All those images have gone now, but oh there is some evidence of of uh, the remnants of bubonic plague on the island. How many people contracted the bubonic plague or confirmed confirmed cases? In Galveston? That's fine. Um, 18. So in terms of treatment, um, well, the first young man who was 17, um, he didn't have a chance. Um, he had terrible fevers and pains, swollen buboes. They weren't exactly sure. But the second person who was um, diagnosed the following day um, received, um, there was a, a Mulford's um, anti-plague serum, as it was called. And um, that was shipped supplies. The city actually had some supplies and then the um, Pasteur Institute sent some supplies over to Galveston as well um, from Paris. So there was also something called um, Hafkin's vaccine. Um, but some of these were really powerful drugs. And I know at least one person who received um, the serum died of anaphylactic shock. So what was the uh, death rate like? I mean, how many people were dying when they would get the bubonic plague? Um, there were, so there were about 12 deaths. Mm, um, okay. But those who actually received some um, vaccine did, did survive. So could you, could you tell us, and I understand there was a doctor who worked at UTMB who actually contracted it. Could you tell us that story? Yeah, so one of the victims of uh, bubonic plague, I mentioned those different longshoremen, um, a housekeeper. Um, one was a pathologist, um, Dr. Anna Mary Bowie. She graduated from um, UTMB in the summer of 1920. Um, she was from Tennessee. And when she graduated, um, she got a job as a pathologist assistant and she was doing autopsies. And in August, she did an autopsy on one of the plague victims. And when she was finishing the autopsy and sewing up the scalp of the, of the woman um, who had died, she accidentally pricked her left index finger. And she was wearing gloves um, and she knew it. 
exactly what to do. Um, she kind of washed the, the wound and then cauterized it and then got on her way, merry way. And of course, then later she started to develop a fever and she knew exactly what it was. Um, swollen lymph glands, all, all the things. So she knew she had bubonic plague. And she um, self-injected both um, the vaccine and the serum. I think um, she was just a brave pathologist, that's all. And she was off work for a couple of months and then went back um, to work. And the first person she did an autopsy on was another victim of bubonic plague. <laughs> and Anna, as I call her, Dr. Bowie or Bowie, um, as a historian, I thought, what an incredible woman to be a pathologist. The first woman to graduate from the School of Medicine was Marie de la Londra in 1897. So UTMB is a history of um, um, early medical, you know, pioneers in medicine. And I, I consider Anna to be one of those. And I couldn't find anything about her after around 1924. And to cut a long story short, I found her an address for her um, she was a member of a medical society and it listed her address in Tennessee. So I, I was probably searching Bowie, Galveston or whatever, and I could find nothing. And a couple of little internet searches later, um, I found um, a website called the Friends of the Bowie Nature Park. And lo and behold, there's a picture of Anna. And that led to a whole other story of Anna and her siblings. And um, they bought land in Fairview, Tennessee, which is was is now actually a park the bowie nature park and they had anna's archive we have nothing about anna at utmb they even have a picture of anna on the steps of old red and probably just as a medical student which they gave me a copy of so um anna's story is actually in the handbook of texas medicine okay so let's take it back a little bit so there's anna bowie which is a fascinating story did did when she moved to tennessee did she like live the rest of her life saying oh i survived the bubonic plague no, Anna was a bit of a trailblazer. I think, um, you know, being a Brit, stiff up her lip, nothing compared to Anna Bowie. She, ne she never mentioned it. Um, she um, um, taught at Peabody uh, Medical College and she, um, she was fired from that job eventually. I think she's a bit of a, a radical in many ways, so ahead of her time. And then she set up a, um, a private practice and um, she was interviewed partly to do with the, the purchase of land with her siblings. And she said, oh yeah, I had bubonic plague. She just mentioned it in passing. <laughs> and then when I met the friends of the Bowie Nature Park, they said, is it true? And I'm like, yeah, it's true. And you know, Anna um, w received a, a 50 years of service um, certificate from UTMB and she died in 1980, age 90. And I would have done anything to meet yeah. her. I think she was such an incredible, Incredible one. I mean, I can't imagine living to age 90 after surviving the bubonic plague, right? It's just, that is insane. Yeah. So as, so how, what was the time frame of this outbreak? Was it only in 1920? Was it kind of quelled towards the end of that year? Or did it did t uh, turn over into 20, or 1921? Um, there were one or two cases in 1921, but I think um, the huge effort in terms of trapping rats and the fumigation, all those things, really kind of quelled the outbreak. So in terms of the damage, yes, people losing their lives is um, it's very tragic, but it could have been a lot worse, mm -hmm. um, for sure. And um, so um, the outbreak itself, um, San Francisco um, had an outbreak in 1900 and this was much more devastating. So some of the protocols that they utilized were um, followed by Galveston. So um, in terms of the rat trapping, et cetera. So they learned from other cities. So trailblazing, yeah, there goes Galveston again, trailblazing and another thing, right? Um, at the time in 1920, was it understood that the fleas were carrying the bubonic plague or was it just the rats? Was, it, was that understood thoroughly? Um, I think so by the, the medical fraternity for sure, yeah. So, um, and I guess, you know, trying to deal with fleas is one thing, but it's, it's the, the rodents that are carrying the fleas. So um, it'd be very difficult to swat fleas. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think it, w it was understood. And obviously the vaccine development, 
um, in the 1890s. It's telling us they have a, have a lot of information on how to deal with this. So you mentioned a uh, pneumonic plague as well. Was that, was that a potential issue, like being near somebody with the bubonic plague? You could easily, it could easily transfer? Yeah, so the different ways of um, um, being infected um, are actually sort of um, abrasions in the skin or droplet inhalation. So if I cough or sneeze on you and I've got bubonic plague, then you're gonna get it. Um, so they're different methods, but they're, they're the main ones. And Anna, obviously her classic needle stick injury was direct um, into, her, mm. into her system. I don't imagine many people wearing masks back in 1920. No masks, mm -hmm. um, but Anna wore gloves. Mm -hmm. But you'll see when they were in the, in the rat dissecting lab, no gloves. That is insane. Hopefully we have a photo of that. I hope we do. And there are gloves. <clears throat> yeah. Because all of us wear <laughs> yeah. gloves. Um, so I kind of want to transition over to Old Red. So Old Red, of course, this amazing building down there in the middle of UTMB's campus. Um, I know they, they set up a separate lab elsewhere. Was Old Red used for any of these uh, dissections after the uh, somebody died of bubonic plague? Um, so the autopsies during uh, um, bubonic plague would have taken place in the hospital, the John okay. C, not in Old Red. Okay. Old Red was really um, sort of administration and um, teaching, but all the surgical procedures and all the autopsies would have been in the old John Seeley. Mm. So I know you have a love for Old Red. It's an amazing building. Um, could you tell us uh, I guess transitioning a little bit away from the bubonic plague, but could you tell us a little bit about the early history of uh, Old Red and how, how fasc the fascinating story behind that building? Yeah, so uh, um, I'm sure many people will know it's, um, it was designed by architect Nicholas Clayton, the jewel in his crown for sure. Um, uh, Old Red, um, I'm really interested in the early days of the medical school and um, if I could be a fly on the wall and um, go back to the early days. What was really interesting was the first faculty um, who applied for jobs, the job, job was actually posted in the British Medical Journal and it, it um, promised that this new medical school would be fully equipped. Um, you know, top of the range in terms of um, acoustics, they have amphitheaters, wonderful sound. And when you read the papers of William Keeler, UTMB's first anatomist, Alan John Smith, UTMB's first pathologist and James Edwin Thompson, first professor of surgery, the, there was nothing. It was an empty building. There were planks on the floor. And the blocker collections have, it was filed under miscellaneous. They had a ledger. And of course, you know, I, I'm very nosy and I want to know everything and see everything. And this ledger turned out to be the record of what the first faculty were buying to set up all the laboratories, the books that they were buying for the first library, all of these things were set up actually in, inside Old Red. So um, I do tours of Old Red. So I'm so semi-retired from doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, tours of Old Red and I want to know what was where in the early days and what I discovered, um, the newspapers um, are really a great source of information. Um, early x-ray experiments were conducted in what they called the basement um, of Old Red in 1897, in a closet in the basement. And I'm one of those people, like I wanna knock on the walls, what's the real wall, what's the false wall, and do a tour. Mm -hmm. So each floor has its own um, history. Um, the building had three amphitheaters, when you have one left. Um, the administrator, administration was on the first floor, um, there was a medical museum overlooking the bay um, for a decade um, from 1891. Our first library was on the first floor, second floor, all the laboratories, embryology, histology, pathology, anatomy, top floor um, dissection lab, the finest dissection hall in America at one point. <laughs> So before I ask you well, kind of what you're working on now, is there anything you would like to, con to conclude the bubonic plague? So we're running short on time here. Okay. To conclude the bubonic plague, anything I missed to ask you, definitely something that you definitely want to um, tell I, the people? I think it was, um, it was a kind of unknown story um, until I'm sure if you were here in 1920, you knew all about it, but you know how things go, people, things are lost to time. And I think if it hadn't been for that tiny little jar I don't think 
we would have thought about it too much. And what was interesting is um, the Historical Foundation have been involved in restoring many buildings and they'd encountered these strange concrete structures and they didn't know what they were and it turned out it was rat proofing. So that tiny little jar, several steps removed, answered an architectural conundrum, which I think is amazing. Um, also, there's been various academic projects, as we know. Um, Leonard Wang published a, a paper recently. So there's various academic spin-offs and interest in the story, which can be nothing but great and hopefully foster some future historians and pathologists. I love that. I love that. You never know what's hiding in the archives somewhere that could spur off an, another story that you can find so much history about, you know, something else. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So what, I know you're working on some pretty fascinating um, history projects now. Can you tell us some, a little bit about what you've got going on? Yeah, um, one that I, I've kind of just completed um, is a story. I love, um, I think I do biographies better than do like institutional histories. Um, I discovered another incredible woman, um, Mary Susan Moore, who is, is known of. Um, she was a black physician who came to Galveston in the 1890s and founded the Hubbard Sanitarium on Avenue N. And she had all kinds of problems. Um, she, the, the local community were just not for her setting up a sanitarium. And I've kind of researched her life and the entries pending in the Handbook of Texas Medicine and the um, Texas State Historical Association. So hopefully in the next few weeks, you'll be to read something of uh, Mary Susan Moore, who also happened to be a member of the Lone Star State Medical Association um, which was set up by black physicians. They had their first meeting in uh, the shop now, um, which houses Rennie Wiley's gallery. They had a meeting there in 1886. So I think there needs to be a, mark, a, a state marker put, there, put up there. And the other little side story I'm working on is, um, I mentioned I was obsessed with postal history. I've been buying um, historical letters um, from a well-known auction site, um, which, um, mention different epidemics. So my, the working title of my little exhibition in my brain is called Letters from an Epidemic. I've been searching the, the, the senders and the recipients and um, just the, the kind of stories of these random letters because people don't write letters anymore. So I've got some amazing letters that I'm researching. I can only imagine how much insight you can get from two doctors going back and forth talking about the different epidemics and outbreaks, for instance, Philadelphia to Galveston in the late 1800s or early 1900s, and how fascinating that must be to be able to take a peek at what they were discussing. Yeah, and there's all kinds of, you know, extraneous information, you know, like Barnum and Bailey, I'm going to see that, but careful as bubonic plague or whatever happens to be. <laughs> Nothing's changed, has it? No. Um, so we've entered the uh, section of this presentation where we will start taking some questions from the audience. So enter the Q&A section. Does anyone have any questions at all? I know we kind of, it's hard to cover uh, an entire year of bubonic plague in 45 minutes. Yes. Are there any instances of other animals getting the bubonic plague? And then how did that kind of affect the town? Well, you know, bubonic plague isn't medieval. It's actually still in the United States. And every year, um, several states uh, including Colorado and Arizona, they have one or two cases of bubonic plague. I think the CDC say between one and 17 cases per year, and they're now treated by antibiotics. So basically, I don't know if you love rodents as much as I do. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you get too close to a dead rodent, uh, prairie dogs and squirrels, um, the fleas may jump onto you, and then you could get bubonic plague. Um, so. There are other um, animals involved, yeah, for sure. All the ones that I really like. <laughs> oh my God. What are some examples of precautions they made in the 1920s that remain here today? Well, rat proofing, for sure, corner stores. Um, I guess the history is probably in, in the newspaper archives and, um, and in the wonderful uh, Galveston, Texas History Center, which uh, Sean will share with us. Um, there were other bits and pieces, but rat proofing is probably the main one um, that I can think of. Um, so if someone gets the plague today, what are the options? Is there a vaccine for it today? Um, antibiotics. That's it? Yes, okay. but the sooner the better. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you that. can see why I'm not a doctor or a nurse, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I think my bedside manner would be, uh... <laughs> Well, I know, I know on the ships, even today, if you go out to the port and look at the ships and you look at the mooring lines, they actually have these covers that go over the mooring lines to keep rats from climbing up the, those ropes, which I find absolutely fascinating. And I, I don't know when that started, but I would imagine people understood that rats carry diseases. Yeah, um, that, that's a great point. Um, yeah, the stopping the rats coming. The other thing that I haven't mentioned is that the story of the first person and the jaw, the narrative might not be over. We've discussed sampling um, from that specimen because we don't know which strain of bubonic pl plague came to the island in the summer of 1920. We think it's the one that came um, from the third pandemic, um, which hit San Francisco. It came from China in 1894 through the trade ships, and it's worked its way um, throughout the sort of natural fauna and flora down to Galveston. Um, but we don't know. And given we know the date and time of death of the first person to die of bubonic plate, we can map it onto the known sort of genomic mm. sequence. But obviously the ethical and legal reasons if we're going to sample, because we're going to have familial DNA. But from what I gather, the, um, the process of selecting different cells, et cetera, are really precise now. So you could avoid familial DNA. So the story of the first person might not be over. Wow. So, so technology as, as it is now, or as it progresses, there may be a way where, um, even if it's not in Galveston, if it's another location where you could actually do the same style of testing and figure out, do this, uh, you know, 123 years later, figure out really what was going on. Yeah, the Mutter Museum at the College, College of Physicians of Philadelphia have worked with McMaster in Canada, and they actually sampled smallpox from um, blades, um, little, um, little blades that were used to um, take samples, vaccine blades, et cetera. Et cetera. But, um, so they've actually got readings. So they've also done research on cholera specimens as well. So these historical antiquities their stories might not be over yet, which is endlessly fascinating, don't you think? And can breathe new life, not really meant as a pun, to these collections that are at risk in terms of conservation or need to be rehoused or they're not being actively used for teaching research. So to utilize some of those collections for contemporary research, working with um, colleagues in the Galveston National Lab could only be a positive, I feel, for the collections. So these collections, I know it's it's a topic that is has a, ch a checkered history, as you say. The collections, um, for context, for their their body parts that were dissected at some point, right? Um, the anatomical, yes. Mm, okay. Um, and the others are removed during autopsy and mm -hmm. kept for that they demonstrated tumors, or so, so other people could use them for um, teaching uh, purposes, really. Mm, okay. All right. I was curious, you have a personal interest in postal history, and now we find out as well that you have a collection. Is there any really interesting fact in terms of that postal history here within the US or even abroad that you think is worth sharing? Well, what I discovered is that there are actually experts on um, fumigated mail. Um, and I'm really interested, and also if you think about DNA, you know now if, if you lick an envelope, not that many people do, but then your DNA is in the sealant, isn't mm. it? I mean, there's potential spin-off here. Um, I think I'm interested in letters because nobody writes them anymore. Um, I'm interested in, this, in social history, but setting that disease within a social context and how people kind of just got on with everyday life, even though there was influenza or whatever happened to be. And then I'm always interested in the people and I like, things that are very challenging. How am I going to find out who they are? What kind of data can I get? And I have managed to find some, but it's a, it's a long, laborious process of trying to re-identify um, male senders and recipients, you know, from the 1880s onwards. But um, I think it's just the human story that really interests me, but it has to be long gone. <laughs> <laughs> Did, that answer you? Did that answer your question? So, so during your uh, research process, in the in the bubonic plague, what is the most what was the most difficult part? Um, I know you you probably came here to the Galveston Texas History Center. Um, you have plenty of records at UTMB as well. What was the most difficult thing to tie together? Well, I think um, finding Anna's story 
um, some of the houses that the people lived in still stand. I, I kind of look for evidence, what is left. So some of the houses that the people lived in and some of the doctor's houses are still, um, it's almost a kind of reconstruction in my brain. And if I could go into, into a little time machine and go and fly through Old Red or something like that in the early days, I'd just be a little, little fly on the wall and see what was going on. I think it's almost, that's, um, it's something that's always, it's kind of, you need an imagination mm -hmm. um, to think about the past. And I know not everyone thinks about the past, but I'd, I'd, I could not fathom a life without the past. I love that. Well, Dr. Sumley, thank you so much for joining me here at the Rosenberg Library. I really, really appreciate you. This episode comes from the Rosenberg Library Conversation Series, where I sat down with a few historians to talk about some extremely interesting historical facts about Galveston and Texas history. I would like to personally thank the Rosenberg Library for allowing Galveston Unscripted to hold live podcast conversations in the library. If this is your first time listening to Galveston Unscripted, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. If you've listened or watched before and you enjoy the content we are putting out in audio and video, please make sure to like, subscribe, and review the podcast. Leave us a review, leave us a rating. It really helps other people find what we are doing here at Galveston Unscripted. Your rating and review helps other people find Galveston Unscripted and discover the amazing history of our little island. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all those social media platforms. I have a secret project called Galveston is Purgatory. <laughs> <laughs>